Tara ta ta. Para papa. Right. What's up, everybody? Just let me know if you uh, can hear us. I think this is the right microphone. We'll see. But if you can hear us and if we are streaming in 1080p, just go ahead and leave a like in the chat. And we will get started here momentarily. We are reporting live from Tribeca tonight. It's a beautiful, beautiful night. And you can see all of the cast iron facades and fire escapes. Hey, well, it looks like we're good, so we might as well kick this off. So, good evening, everybody, and welcome back to Walks and Wall Street. Today is April 18th, 2024, and it's about 9.16 p.m. Eastern Time here in New York City. Now, we're here in Tribeca. We're on the corner of Church Street and Franklin Street. I was here in Lower Manhattan a little bit late tonight because I had a showing just up the block just up the block. Um, Franklin Place, we have a listing. It's called 5 Franklin Place. We're trying to sell Unit 8A, beautiful three-bed, three-and-a-half bathroom apartment. And uh, clients wanted to see it late, so that is why I'm here. It's a bit of a windy night, a bit of a cold night too. Uh, but we have a lot to talk about. Some corporate earnings uh, we have to go through tonight down the list. I think most notably Netflix reported earnings today, uh, even though they beat 
the stock was down after hours, but I thought it was a pretty decent uh, earnings report uh, for Netflix. Now, Netflix said its first quarter uh, in its first quarter shareholder letter that it will stop reporting quarterly subscriber gains, which is quite interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, talk about a turnaround in this company. I kind of attribute it to the same thing as Meta, right? If we look back all the way uh, to Meta's explosion, uh, when the stock topped all the way back in 2021, it hit a high of $382, and then it hit a low of 91 bucks. <laughs> That was in November of 2022, and now we are trading well into new all-time record highs for Meta. So to put this into from some perspective here, uh, full year, full fiscal year 2021 EPS was $13.77 for Meta. In 2022, there was a massive, massive earnings contraction. Earnings declined 38% to $8.59 for full fiscal year EPS. Now. Throughout 2023 and into 2024, massive earnings rebound. Fiscal year 2023 earnings for Meta was $15.58, an 81% turnaround in earnings, and estimates for 2024 is $23.98, up another 54%. Now, if you want to look out all the way to 2025, earnings are seen up another 10%, $26.41. Um, but if we go over to Netflix, ticker symbol NFLX, we're sort of seeing almost the same exact thing. You know, as an example here, I'll bring you back uh, behind the computer screen here, just so we could see a visual. Check this out. So 2021 EPS full year was $11.24. Earnings are up about 85%. Uh, but then through 2022, we had this massive earnings decline, about 11% earnings decline. The stock got pretty much cut in half, and we've recovered almost back to previous record highs. Now, look at the earnings rebound here, 2023, $12.03. Estimates for 2024 is coming in at $17.52. That's a 48% or excuse me, 46% earnings rebound. Uh, fiscal year 2025. Earnings are seen uh, recovering 22% again, or accelerating to the upside, um, $21.34. Kind of interesting. Very, very interesting stuff. Uh, we'll watch for that turnaround story as well. But again, the stock is down after hours as the overall market is quite crummy, my friends. All right, let's get this stream started. I'm excited to walk you guys around Tribeca. It's a very, very fun neighborhood. Uh, very cool, very hip, very friendly. Now, if you did not receive our free investing newsletter, you can go ahead and scan the QR code on your screen, punch in your email, and it will take you to our investor letter called Behind the Street. This is our Substack. We covered a lot of things. We covered CPI in the latest newsletter. We also covered commodities, live cattle, lean hogs, coffee is ripping, cocoa is ripping yet again. And then we obviously covered precious metals um, as a flight to safety trade. And then we talked a little bit about the Bitcoin halving. So if you want to check out all of our equity research and receive it every other Thursday, right as the market closes, just go ahead, scan the QR code on your screen, punch in your email and you will get it. Cool. All right, let me close up my computer here. Um, I had to put away my umbrella too. It was a pretty crummy day um, in New York, but the good news is the rain stopped and hopefully the rain is out of here for good. All right, let me say hello to everybody in the chat. Let's see, Lance, let me get the umbrella, put that away. Boom, boom, boom. Cool. All right, everybody, we are on the corner of Franklin Street and Church Street. I'll go ahead and get the QR code out of the way for all of you. And I see Peter. What's going on? Gary Carpenter, Lance, Wendy England, Mary. Thanks so much for joining us. John G, Margaret V, welcome, welcome. Shannon, 
RPT, thanks for joining. John, welcome everybody, Fun Feeds and Solo401. Alan, welcome, welcome, welcome. Now, I'm excited to be in Tribeca tonight because we haven't been here in quite some time. You're going to see a lot of these older style pre-war buildings with these beautiful cast iron facades and fire escapes. And we are currently right now on Franklin Street, not to be confused with Franklin Place. If you walk all the way down Franklin Street, you'll see a private street called Franklin Place. Go to Street Easy, type in 5 Franklin Place, and we are listing Unit 8A. It's a three bedroom, three and a half bathroom apartment. We listed it at $3,495,000, just under 2,000 square feet. So it's priced, it's, uh, it's priced at $1,776 a foot, which is a pretty good deal for Tribeca, right? A lot of units in Tribeca are priced well into the 2,000 area, $2,000 a foot. You have the Roxy Hotel right ahead of you, but you also have this very, very unique and gorgeous view of the Empire State Building and this kind of cool dog off to the right too. DC322 says, please fix the title. What title? Uh, guys, this is 56 Leonard. Look at how cool this building is. Um, this is called the Jenga building. Now, the real address is 56 Leonard, but everybody nickname, nicknames the building the Jenga building because it looks exactly like that. Uh, it looks like a Jenga puzzle. So let's go ahead and check that out. They also have one of those bean sculptures like you see in uh, Chicago. Wow, guys, look at this. You can see that moon with the clouds moving by and these beautiful pre-war buildings in Tribeca with the newer Jenga building to your right. It's a really cool shot. Daryl, what's up? Thanks for joining us. Yeah, Solo 401 is one of the most photographed buildings for sure. It's super unique, isn't it? I think it looks even better now that you kind of have a partly cloudy sky. So you can see the clouds transitioning behind the building. It actually looks pretty cool. And that spire is the spire for the Freedom Tower. One World Trade Center. Yeah, Victor says the Jenga building looks great. The address is 56 Leonard. And this is one of the most expensive neighborhoods in all of New York City. However, Tribeca was just dethroned by the West Village for the most expensive neighborhood. But Tribeca is still very, very trendy. A lot of, I would say, younger families with kids like to move in this neighborhood. A lot of celebrities have lived or currently live in this neighborhood too. Um, it's very unique. You're centrally located. I mean, you're just steps away from Lower Manhattan. Man, you could really see the intricacies and the details of 56 Leonard at night. Yeah, Rick from PA. It does look like the bean, isn't it? Ed Dunkel. Yeah. Um, they just recently put it in too. I think it's been there for about maybe a little under a year now. We'll go over and check it out. Now there's a lot of unique buildings down here. The building that we're on, well we have a listing in, is 5 Franklin Place. And the facade of the building actually opens up. It's very, very unique. So the facade of the building opens up. You drive your car into the building on this little elevator pad and it'll take your car down into the basement and park it for you. So it's not a traditional parking garage where you can just, uh, you know, go in and park yourself. The machine does it for you. I'll have to show you guys a video of it one time, uh, but it is extremely, extremely cool. K 
Cape Cod Sarah says, can we walk around Brooklyn sometime? Yeah, we can. When the weather's a little bit nicer, we can, because it's windy and cold and nasty over there. And after working 12 hours a day, I just the last place I want to go is Brooklyn, honestly. But when it's nice out, we are going to be going, we're going to be venturing out a lot, a lot further than just, you know, the usual places we usually go to. Uh, but it is definitely coming, for sure. I feel as if we also have a lot of standalone walking videos too. Uh, Brooklyn, particularly Dumbo. I think one of my favorite neighborhoods in general in Brooklyn is Dumbo by the Olympia Dumbo, the new development there, which is awesome. This is the New York Law School. Now everybody, Neil Kashkari, did anybody see that? One of the Fed presidents uh, came out again today and said, you know what, it's probably realistic that we wait all the way until 2025 to have our first rate cut, uh, which has sent the bond market in a little bit of a tangent here. I'm not sure if you guys were paying attention, but the two-year Treasury yield is pretty much at 5% yet again. So bond yields are really, really blowing out, uh, and interest rates are going up yet again. As we know, there's an inverse correlation between bond prices and yields. So whenever we have a little bit of a sell-off in the bond market, I'd like to say that that is the market pricing in uh, a higher rate environment. And this really all changed. Now, to be fair and give you know everybody in the chat a little bit of credit, most people here, uh, as we've been you know having our conversations, most people have been predicting no rate cuts anytime soon, particularly particularly in, uh, what's it called? In the summer, next to zero, rate cuts. Um, but the market, right, particularly if you look at the CME futures, uh, Fed futures tool, it was pricing in a 25 basis point rate cut in June. Now, it looks like there's a 90% certainty that we don't have any rate cuts over the summer. Uh, and I actually think that's the right thing. And all of this started to change after that hotter than expected CPI print, right? Uh, which came in at 3.5%. So sustained, I should say well, well sustained, 3% inflation is unacceptable for the United States. And I think if we were to cut interest rates anytime soon, that would really, really be a disservice to the country. And I think it would put a lot of pressure on the lower and middle class um, Americans here. Check these buildings out. What do you guys think? Do you like the more pre-war a little bit better? Or do you think you like... Uh, Kind of the billionaires row super talls. What do you think? Hey, Brad. As I said that two months ago, they aren't cutting this year. I don't think they should. King Jerbo says New York is nothing like it used to be. Wait till the market crashes. Comments like that are usually for people, are usually from people that are number one are non-New Yorkers, and number two, have no skin in the game, uh, meaning they have no money, and they don't own any property here, they don't do any business here, usually. I'd say there's about a 90% certainty. Uh, Ed Dunkel says, I love the lofts. I do too. Uh, these are loft-style buildings. I mean, those ceilings are probably 12 foot plus. Some of them even look like to be like 15 foot ceiling heights. It's cool down here. It's a different, different vibe. And it's quiet, too. Uh, so I'd say it's more livable. Definitely, definitely more livable. Oftentimes, we walk around, you know, Midtown Manhattan, Billionaire's Row, kind of area where, I, where we work, where we have our office. You see a lot of foot traffic at night. And so a lot of people that watch these streams, they think that New York is only that, right? They think that there's people walking around the streets all the time in New York City. 
uh, when it's not really the case, right? New York is very, very diverse, not only in its neighborhoods, but in its architectural integrity, like you see here. So Tribeca, I would really say after seven o'clock at night, really, really empties out because it's very, very residential. However, sometimes on the weekends, you'll see a major, major pickup in foot traffic. But here is one of my favorite shots of all time on the corner of Thomas Street and Broadway. Look at that. Beautiful spire of One World Trade Center. Maybe we'll head there tonight. I think we have a few minutes. We'll head a little bit deeper downtown. But this is looking uptown. You can see the spire of the Empire State Building. It's kind of nice. Solo 401 says, Fadai is my favorite. Each area has its own charm. Uh, Solo, maybe we'll have enough time to go to Stone Street tonight. I think all of you would really, really enjoy Stone Street. Now, speaking of loft style apartments, look at those. These are really cool. You have one, two up there. Wow, look at this, guys. One three five Broadway. This building has a little bow on it. This building's probably well over a hundred years old. Teenies. Super cool. They have a bar upstairs. Looks like kind of like a speakeasy place. Hey, Ipadia, what's going on? NBA Elias. Says, hope you had a good day. I did. I did. Uh, things are starting to pick up, which is good. This is a cool shot. Dizzy Lizzy, what's up? Let's check out the World Trade Center. We'll go all the way down, might as well. Now the sell-off broad-based uh, started to really accelerate again today and we're starting to have a big bid in the put-to-call ratio so a lot of times the put-to-call can give you false signals but generally speaking it's a good indicator uh, to gauge market sentiment and it really starts to pick up at major market turning points. Uh, so for example if you look at the put-to-call around when we had the big COVID crash, went to Mars. And when you, usually when you have these big blow-offs in the put-to-call ratio, which essentially means people are stacking the puts out of the market, that generally is a good indication of, all right, we're probably a little bit oversold. There's probably way too much fear in the marketplace. Uh, and we're probably gonna have a move in the opposite direction. We're just starting to see the put-to-call ratio kind of really go wild here. Um, and we are now four solid trading days back to back to back to back closer, uh, or I should say lower uh, in terms of closes on the S&P. Hey, Troy Atman, what's going on? Thanks for joining us. Jose Santos is Israel airstrikes in Iran. Well, here's an interesting thing about that. You know, today, did anybody notice the price action in crude oil today? Anybody? 
Well, crude was actually lower. So again, kind of the way I think about this whole mess in the Middle East that we got going on, I don't think it's going to morph into the World War III situation that everybody thinks. I really don't. Uh, because you would be having significant follow through in crude and it'd probably be already over $90 a barrel. Um, it's at 82 bucks, right? Which is the three point move lower from when this stuff started. Now we're right at the 50 day, right? We're right at the 50 day moving average, but I guess we can take this as good news because this to me is essentially the market saying things are going to de-escalate here and it's not going to, you know, blow over into a major World War III scenario. At least that's what we're hoping and praying for, right? So we'll see. Here's another shot of the Trade Center. Look at this building, right on the corner of Chambers Street. So this used to be completely covered in scaffolding. Yeah, Peter, that's Brent crude. I usually focus on uh, light crude oil. So ticker symbol CL is usually the futures contract that I watch. Man, that's an awesome shot. All right, let's continue to head down by the Four Seasons Hotel. But I don't know. I mean, what, do you, what are your thoughts? Uh, does anybody think the opposite? I think it'd be interesting to hear an opposite take of mine. Does anybody think that this sort of, uh, you know, escalation in the Middle East is going to turn into a World War III type scenario like many people are predicting? Jack CW says, what's next for mooning gold? Uh, yeah, you know, that's another thing, right? You have uh, gold trading just below $2,400 an ounce after a massive multi-decade breakout in a new highs. So you have commodities in general leading. You have precious metals leading, like gold, silver, uh, and I think that's very indicative of the market, right? All while you have a strong dollar, the Dixie. Now, I'm working on an interesting deal at 70 Little West Street. And it's a parking garage. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to structure it where we zone each individual space into deeded condominiums. So similar to what we did at 69th Street, the deal. Uh, if you want to look up the address, it's 301 East 69th Street. You can check it out. Uh, it's funny because it was actually the old Mayfair co-op right there on 69th street it was the garage to the co-op an investor bought it and then they had to sell about 75 percent of the space back to the city via eminent domain because they had to build the se the second avenue subway so the garage went from about i think it was originally like 77 spaces down to 22 because they had to sell part of the garage underground to the city so they could build out that subway entrance if anybody's familiar with that, if you go right to the corner of 69th Street and 2nd, um, you'll see the big brand new, and it's actually really nice, uh, entrance to the subway, for the 2nd Avenue subway. So when the co-op sold to these investors, the investors were like, all right, instead of operating a valet style garage, what we could do is we could go to the city and you know do a rezoning 
uh, and sell them as individual condos. And I think you're going to start to see that business model pop up more and more. Because number one, a lot of these parking garages are very, very cumbersome and laborious to operate. So they'll probably just sell them as individual deeded condo spaces. And then it's up to the HOA to deal with the maintenance and fix it. Because to operate a garage, uh, particularly with labor costs and not being able to find you know, people to operate it that are trustworthy, you know, they're dinging and denting the cars, this is just a better route. Which is interesting because people in New York City buy parking spaces ranging from $175,000 to $300,000. Um, which many of you listening to this, you're like, what? For a parking space? 300000 Yeah, I mean, particularly if it's in building. Uh, the building that we have a listing in, which is just at the block at 5 Franklin Place, they have a garage in the building and each space is an individual sponsor unit and they go for 300000 There's only three left out of the 18. So it's kind of crazy. And this is all in the face of New York really deterring driving, right? Uh, they're getting rid of more street parking in New York City to build city bikes. Uh, they're implementing more tolls, like the congestion pricing that's gonna come in pretty soon. So this has actually been an interesting hot commodity, which is, I ne never really would have thought would be the case, but it is. AUS Fly Girls, is that one and done for the parking space? Well, you have, it's a condo, right? So you have to pay all of your overhead. Wow, guys, look at this. Check this out, guys, this is unreal. Man, Freedom Tower looks beautiful. God bless America, right? Uh, but anyway, yes and no. So you, you pay, right, the 175 grand for the space, but then since it's a condo, technically, you have three components. You have your taxes, right? You gotta pay the taxes of the city in New York, you can't get around that, which is around $340 a month. Uh, your HOA is very low, your common charges, because it's a parking space, so it's like 75 bucks. And then there's usually a security component because this is Manhattan, <laughs> you know, uh, you want to have 24-7, 365 security, cameras rolling, uh, and you want to have that backlog to some sort of server, right? So if anybody breaks in or there's a ding or dent, you could just pull the cameras. And that's usually around like $125 a month. So all in, your monthly overhead is around $550 a month. Okay, Fulton Street here, everybody. This is the Oculus. Look at that. They've built this Oculus to resemble a dove's wings. I think if we step back a little bit, you'll be able to see it in a little bit more detail. Troy Atmans is, would it be cheaper just to Uber everywhere every day or get on the subway? Uh, maybe, it's possible, but many people in New York, particularly, you know, if you think about the clientele who can, chances are if you can afford to buy, you know, a $200,000 parking space, you're probably at the point in your life where you're looking for convenience. So maybe even have a driver, maybe you just, you know, park the car there and you're just looking for a convenience factor too. Look at that. I don't know, a lot of people and a lot of uh, very well-renowned architects have kind of talked down the Oculus. I actually think it looks pretty nice, to be honest. And then you could get the PATH train in New Jersey uh, as well as the one and I believe the A train is right here too in the Oculus. I think it's nice. Now, this is the new Performing Arts Center right here in Lower Manhattan that just opened. 
This also looks really nice. And it's just at the base of the World Trade Center. But I would like to recommend one thing, which I think is not talked about as much as it should be. If you're visiting Lower Manhattan, obviously what everybody wants to do is they want to check out uh, the reflection pools, which are right here. That's actually where the old trade centers used to stand. Now they're those beautiful reflecting pools. Uh, then they want to walk around the Oculus and the like. But I would suggest going across the street. So cross West Street, and there's this really, really stunning indoor mall. And if you go all the way to the back, you'll be right on the Hudson River. And that has some of the most spectacular sunsets I've ever, ever, ever seen in my life. Not exaggerating. Uh, you're right on the Hudson River. You're overlooking all of New Jersey. You can see Hoboken. It's a beautiful, beautiful experience. And they have a lot of outdoor dining too. Um, we're not gonna be able to go in, but we might as well cross the street and check it out. It's not windy for once. But we are now directly at the main base of the World Trade Center. This is the main entrance to the brand new Trade Center. It stands 1,776 feet tall. These are the main doors. Now here we have it. This is Brookfield Place. If you, if you don't want to cross the street, one of the things that you could do is you could go inside the Oculus and then just look for the path train. Once you see the path train, continue to walk down that corridor and it'll bring you under the street here, which is West Street, and it'll take you inside Brookfield Place, right here awesome awesome area and if you walk all the way to the back in Brookfield Place you have this huge outdoor patio with restaurants and it's overlooking Hoboken New Jersey now guys check this out this is earnings season and at the beginning of earnings season, we talk about all of the main financial institutions. Now, right across the street, this big behemoth of a building right here, this is arguably one of the most powerful investment banks in the entire world. This is Goldman Sachs. And they reported an amazing, amazing, amazing quarter just the other day because investment banking activity is picking up yet again on the street. All right, let's cross West Street. We might as well. We'll explore over here since the weather is improving a little bit. Hopefully the internet will hold up. Ah, the Austin Tennis. As I've taken a few sunsets there, uh, and I can confirm it's stunning. It's, it's really cool. Really, really cool place. Austin Tennis, hopefully you're doing well. Thanks for joining us as we are standing directly at the base of the World Trade Center. All right, let's cross. Now what you're about to see is something else that's pretty spectacular see this bike path here well this is a bike and running path this will take you all the way pretty much around the island of Manhattan all the way up to the Hudson Yards and even past the Hudson Yards too so when it's nice out and let's say if you work in lower Manhattan and you live on 34th Street well you can go all the way over to the Hudson River and take this beautiful bike path all the way down to Lower Manhattan to work and it's an amazing view because the further up you are you have these really 
really iconic views of the World Trade Center. And there's tennis courts, there's pickleball courts, basketball courts, and you're overlooking the Hudson River. It's really, really cool. So we'll make a left right at Goldman Sachs. The address is 200 West Street. And this is on the corner of Vesey Street. Now the base of the World Trade Center is massive. It's like this giant cube as the base of the building. I really don't think the video does it justice. You kind of have to come down here and see it for yourself. It's a really, really massive building. All right, here we are, 200 West Street, Goldman Sachs. Just reported a great quarter along with pretty much all the major banks, uh, which we talked about before, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase. Um, the common factor on earnings season for the major financials is a rebound in deal flow, both in M&A and IPO activity. And hence you have that major earnings rebound. Here you have American Express and RBC Capital Markets. Uh, Troy Atmans is breaking. Unconfirmed reports are now arriving. Israel has struck targets in a major city in Iran. Well, what's crude doing right now after hours? So these are some of the restaurants here. You also have the Conrad Hotel, but this is the side entrance of Brookfield Place. And this is the Lower Manhattan Del Frisco's. We always talk about Del Frisco's. This is a cool like indoor outdoor corridor here. Uh, Brian Enns is up 3%. Let's walk through here, we'll check it out. Now Netflix reported earnings after the bell and they actually reported a pretty good quarter. Stock is down I think 5 or 6% after hours. Overall market is in a steep correction, the first correction we've had in this new bull market. This is really cool. You have the entrance to the Conrad, which is right here. And then you have the back entrance of 200 West Street. Uh, John says that Del Frisco's isn't your favorite location. It's not my favorite either. My favorite location for Del Frisco's is adjacent from Radio City Music Hall. Yeah, AUS Flag Rolls. Does everything feels calm and clean? It is. It's nice down here. It's very, very different from where we usually walk in Midtown. We started off the stream in Tribeca. Here, I'll take you guys to the Hudson River. We're about a block away.
Now in this park here, I used to coach soccer back in the day as a teenager, right at the end of North End Way. I used to coach soccer here. Here's another shot of the corridor we just walked through. Yeah, the Austin Tennis is Lower Manhattan isn't as interesting to me except for the Hudson River. I can see why people like to live in Tribeca because, you know, if you've been in the city and you work in the city every day, it can be rather taxing. And I just had a conversation with a friend today about it. You know, if you wake up and every day it's windy, it's rainy, it's nasty, it feels like a chore just getting out of your apartment. You know, it feels like you have to battle. I don't know how to explain it. Uh, in contrast, you know, when you're in Miami, it's like you're looking forward to getting up and starting the day. I don't know how to explain it. So to kind of maybe live in a place like this, in lower Manhattan or in Tribeca, where it's quiet, like you don't see a lot of foot traffic, it's kind of a nice reprieve from, you know, being in crazy midtown all day, particularly if you have a kid. You know, if you have kids, I totally understand why people like Tribeca, totally understand why people like the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side. It's quieter, right? People need a little bit of a break. But on the other hand, if you're young, if you're a working professional, well, then Midtown's great. You know, Murray Hill is fantastic because it's going to be rocking all the time. East Village, you know, West Village. I get it, totally get it. All right, look at this. Here we have New Jersey. Great views of Hoboken. Really, really nice views of Hoboken. And this is the main ferry terminal. <laughs> Got a little bit of a music video shoot going on over here. Get a load of that guy. Now this is a cool shot too, look at that. So you have this beautiful park here, and then you have this really, really cool running path that goes all along the Hudson River. Look at that. And that is the beautiful skyline of New Jersey. What do you guys think? Brad's brain says, Tom, did you watch the full Miami Vice clip? I did. That's cool. You know, I never really watched the show but uh, I'm glad you sent it to me. And maybe I'll have to get into it. Miami Vice. Pretty cool. I think you guys are going to get a real kick out of this. Just look off to your left a little bit and you're going to see a little green dot in the distance. That is going to be the Statue of Liberty. This is probably the best spot to watch the sunset. Because you see all of Hoboken, 
you see the Statue of Liberty, and you can see the Verrazano Bridge too. There she is, Statue of Liberty. cool right look at this little lost soccer ball right here You can see the terminal kind of rocking up and down. Cool stuff. If you guys are enjoying the live stream so far tonight, feel free to leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel if you're new. Oh, look at how fast that you can really tell how strong the current is. The soccer ball is already way over here. We were just looking at it two seconds ago over here. It doesn't look like a strong current, but it is. It's a really, really strong current. Now, it's insane to think that during Hurricane Sandy, right where we're standing was totally submerged in water. So think about that for a second. Oh, right where we're standing was totally submerged. The water would be about neck deep on me right now. Insane. Oh, this is cool. We're going to see the ferry pull right up. see if he sticks this landing here what do you guys think sticks the landing or bungles it I think he's gonna stick it it's a pretty good parallel park job I guess Stuck the landing. Here we go. Jerry says, Tom, can you see the Colgate clock? Yeah, we can zoom in on it for sure. There it is. Colgate clock. All right, we'll walk down a little bit more, and this is going to be the backside of the Brookfield place that we were just talking about. Look at that dog with the cone on its head. And you know, it's nice now because you can't enjoy this about 80% of the year. 80% of the year, it's windy, it's dark, it's miserable, but now that we're getting into the spring and in the summer, this is going to be an amazing place to come. Wow, he's already out of there. It was a quick trip. Let's zoom in on the Statue of Liberty a little bit.
Oops. All right, here you have it. This is what we were talking about. This is a really, really cool outdoor patio space right behind Brookfield Place. You have this amazing view here. Lots of seating area. I'll have to take a video down here during the day, during the summer. This place is packed. And you can see all the retail storefront just off to the left. They set up really nice outdoor dining facilities here. So right all along here, all these restaurants will have outdoor seating. And then there is the main atrium. Yeah, Peter's is not a soul out tonight. It's usually like this. You know, it's usually like this in lower Manhattan. Here's the oyster bar. And here's the outdoor dining. So check it out. It's a very underexplored place, especially for tourists. So if you're coming to New York, check out Brookfield Place. Next time you come and look at the World Trade Center, it's PJ Clark's. Yeah, Dizzy Lizzy says, wow, I love this place. It's really cool. Really, really cool. Underrated. We almost never come over here. Now, Brookfield Place is a big mall. It has a lot of high-end shops. It's a cool place to walk around when it's raining and nasty in New York, which is more often than not, unfortunately. But this is where I usually hang out, right in here. This is a huge atrium. MB says, shouldn't it be busy? No, it's usually very quiet and dead. And it's also, hey guys, it's like 10.30 at night, is it not? So th this is a mall in here. All right, just for... Uh, just for the sake of, you know, professionalism, no more, uh, you know, comments in the chat about Israel airstrike. It may not be true. It could be true because we don't know. And, you know, there is a lot of people who have family in both regions and both Israel uh, and Iran. So it's just not it's just not a good look just to be spamming that in the chat. I get it. I get it. It's breaking news. It does impact the financial markets, but it's one of those situations where it's like, you gotta know 100% or, you know, don't put it in the chat and like spam it, just respectfully. Now this is a crazy, crazy sunset when the sun is setting. So you walk directly outside Brookfield Place And boom, imagine the sun setting all over Hoboken. You can see the Statue of Liberty. It's insane. What do you guys think? Should I try to take you guys in here? It looks like people are in. Let's see if I can take you on a walk around the inside. 
yeah, Donald Pate says, thank you, I come here to escape the news. Yeah, I mean, it's okay to talk about the news, it's just like, something like this is pretty, like a pretty big deal, and, you know, like impacts real people if there's going to be like, major airstrikes that kill people, so it's, it's best not to get people kind of riled up, I guess, if that makes sense. Because we don't know. We don't know yet. All right. Welcome to Miami. I mean, welcome to, welcome to the inside of Brookfield Place. What do you guys think? You have Farragamo down here, you have the Nike store. It's cool to have palm trees. Sometimes I'll come on the second floor and eat up there. Ace Options Trading. We're just exploring Lower Manhattan. Took a look at Goldman Sachs headquarters at 200 West Street. And now we are in Brookfield Place. Hey, Gene 1649, thank you so much for your very generous $5 donation. I appreciate you very much. Thank you for supporting. Brad's brain says, Tom, are your stop rules based on percentage or moving average? Uh, both, and it also depends on how much cushion I have, right? So if I have a really low cost basis on a stock and we get into a market gyration like we do now, if a stock that I own breaks the 50 on like really, really aggressive volume, uh, just so I don't, you know, shake out my core position, because if this if a stock closes, you know, one or two percent below the fifty and hangs out there for five days, that's eh okay. But you don't want to really blow out the entire position. You really want to let the market take you out, so to speak. And then, if we have a follow through day, and that same stock that I let go, let's say if I let fifteen percent of the position go, if it regains the fifty on higher volume, I'll just buy the whole position back. Right, you gotta get back in there and, and get in that stock again. Um, but that is kind of what I'll do. So if you have a bad break of a 50, I'm letting something go in 15% increments, which will force me to take profits. Um, but on the other hand, which I think is very important, and this is kind of what I was taught is you gotta go buy back the position again if you have a follow through day and, and your stock, whatever it may be, starts trending back above the 50, you just gotta buy the whole thing back, um, even if it's at higher prices. What'd you guys think? Yeah, that was the inside of Brookfield Place. Pretty cool, right? And here's another shot of World Trade Center. If you guys are enjoying the live stream so far tonight, 
feel free to leave a like on the video and click the subscribe button if you're new. We do these every single day starting at 8.30. Here's another cool outdoor dining section here. Nick says, do you think the palm trees are real? Yes, they are real in there. Uh, they also have real palm trees in the atrium by the old Deutsche Bank. Wow, can you guys imagine how amazing this must look during the day? Look at all these tulips. There's literally probably a hundred plus tulips here. Maybe hundreds of tulips. Look at that. Wow. Seems to go on forever. Look at these. Hey, the AUS Fly Girl, thank you so much for your $10 donation. Says always appreciate your walks and wisdom and cool vibes. Appreciate the support. Now, you guys want to know something cool? And I know the majority of you like to see, you know, more midtown Manhattan where people are walking around and it's, you know, a lot of action, but sometimes it's kind of nice to come on the outskirts in New York where it's a lot less traveled, a lot less people. So that's what we're doing tonight. We'll be back in Midtown tomorrow though. Don't worry. Um, but apparently today is the, well, I believe it is. I think this is the, uh, the day when we officially started the channel. I think about three years ago. April 19th, 2021, I think. So it's been three years. Time flies. So I appreciate everybody joining these streams each and every night. Very, very cool. And now we have like 40 plus thousand people subscribed to the channel, which is awesome which I really do appreciate too. So thanks for being here for three years. The volleyball court out here. Oh, Jeff, the 19th is tomorrow. Copy that. Sam Oliver versus Tom. The Dow is down 450 points after hours. Looks like we have a little bit of capitulation going on.
Ronix is Tom, the Trump Media DJT, was up 25% today. Any opinion on the move up? I don't have any opinion on the move up. I don't watch the stock. Um, I, I just don't think it's worth watching. It's not a real company in my eyes. And that's not a political statement. I'm a conservative. So if, if you know, you had to you know, put a gun to my head and say, hey, you vote for Trump or vote for Biden, I'd vote for Trump. But ticker symbol DJT, it's not a real company. It's quite possible the thing is a fraud. Um, it has $3 million in revenue. It was a SPAC deal. Uh, I know some people who know some interesting things about the deal that will raise some eyebrows, which I can't say, but I think people will speculate on it. I think it'll be treated as a meme stock, and I don't really watch it because it's just not, it's just not a viable, it's uninvestable for me. You know, three million in revenue. I don't know what the projections are. It loses money. And there's a lot of other companies out there on the market that don't lose money and that do $3 million in revenue uh, every hour. So I'd rather focus on those. Not to be super curt and blunt about it, but that's just the reality. And look, maybe the company will, maybe the company will do good. I don't know. But in terms of the, that SPAC deal, it's, uh, you know, I mean, what, what's the valuation? Four, three or four billion dollar valuation and on three million in revenue a year? Eh, I think that's crazy numbers. But look, people will speculate on anything. Noodles, I did not try kava yet. Still have not tried it. All right, everybody, let's head back into the city. You're gonna see some beautiful Belgian block streets here in a minute as we head over to Stone Street. But this is an awesome area in New York City. It's really amazing. <laughs> yeah, Brad, Brad's brain. I know you have one share of DJT. That's so funny. Look, I mean, me, I mean, if the company, you know, let's say if they next year they somehow miraculously do like 24 million in revenue. And be like, okay, well, let's see where the projections of this company is. But I think the lesson here is in the investment business. Oh, look at this place. This is a cool little tavern. And you have the spire of the World Trade Center here. But you got to think about it like this. And this is kind of how I was taught. You have the free will to, to put your hard-earned money to work wherever you want. So why wouldn't you put it to work in the best stock, right? Like, it's not like you have a gun in your head. You have to buy these money-losing companies. So why don't you take part in companies that are churning out ridiculous profits and that are addressing a huge TAM? right? Companies that have a revolutionary product addressing a massive TAM, total addressable market, and are consistently compounding out their earnings quarter over quarter, year after year, right? So if I'm playing pickup basketball and I have three choices, LeBron James is standing in front of me, uh, and two random, you know, 80-year-old men are standing in front of me. Am I going to pick 
the 80 year old men or am I going to pick LeBron James? I'm going to pick the superstar. I'm going to pick LeBron James, right? And also, it's very important to preserve your mental capital in the investment game. So, and, and it really, and you really understand it over time. Uh, if you have a portfolio of stocks, all of your time, energy, and focus is on doing diligence, making sure management is doing what they're supposed to do, making sure the company is on the correct trajectory. So if you're focused on all these other nonsensical stocks, it may not seem like it, but you are exhausting, uh, you're quite literally exhausting precious, precious mental capital on things that don't deserve it. So that's kind of why I never really paid much attention to the meme stuff. Um, it just, you know, they'll pump these stocks and then they'll go to zero and then there'll be some new fad. They'll pump the stocks, then they'll go to zero, you know, things like that. All right, let's cross the street or jog across the street. And this is the tunnel that'll take you out to Brooklyn. Yeah, Peter says is Lower Manhattan prone to very, very heavy, heavy flooding. It's prone to extreme heavy flooding. Extreme, extreme heavy flooding, unfortunately. Now, where we're standing was totally, totally underwater during Hurricane Sandy, unfortunately. Yeah, Theo's a sage advice, mental capital is crucial. Totally. And mental capital is so important to preserve in your own personal life too. You know, you know, in both business and in personal life. So if you have toxic people in your life and it seems like every time you talk to this person, it's just, they're just a basket of complaints. This sucks, that sucks, life sucks, this is unfair, this is not, this is unfair wah, 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 bitch and complain, you got to get those people away from you. You have got to get that toxicity away. It's the same thing, you know, with garbage stocks. You know, if you're buying garbage penny stocks, uh, you're going to get garbage results. If you're hanging around toxic people that complain and, you know, make excuses all day, well, it's going to drag you down with it, right? So you have got to you know, you got to plant the tulips and seed the tulips and pluck the weeds, right? You want your life looking like, you know, Bryant Park in the summer. Green grass, tulips, you know, all the beautiful stuff. Now, this is the W Hotel and Tower. Now, there's an issue with this tower here, okay? It's 123 Washington. One of my coworkers did a deal here, and there's only two elevator shafts for all of these units. So if one elevator breaks down, which apparently they do a lot, you're not gonna be feeling well walking 50 flights of stairs to your apartment. Now, this is something you should always look for if you're looking to buy a condo in Manhattan. Number one, focus on the amount of units that are in the building total and the amount of total elevator shafts. Because let's say if the building has 580 units and there's two elevators, well, there's going to be a lot of wear and tear on those elevators, which means two things. Number one, they're probably going to go down all the time. And number two, you're probably going to, your common charges are probably going to go up because you're going to have to pay somebody to fix uh, the elevators all the time. Because if you have two elevator shafts for 580 units, those elevators are going to get used and used and used constantly all the time, uh, which is going to put significant wear and tear on them. Not a lot of people think about that stuff, but it is important. Because if you're just viewing an apartment one time, right? You get mesmerized by the view, you think it's all great, but you're only there for 20 minutes, tops, if you're viewing an apartment. You're not living there. So you really don't understand and know about all the problems and, until you move in, unfortunately. Um, so make sure, and you could ask the super, you could ask the management, 
become really buddy buddy with the doormen and uh, they'll tell you all the dirty secrets about the building. And also, quite obviously, if you're thinking about resale value, this is another great shot of the World Trade Center. Uh, if you're thinking about resale value, you also need to think about general competition. So if you buy in a building in Manhattan that has 13 units, by the time you want to go to sell, there's going to be a very, very high probability there's going to be no other competing units in your building because there's only 13 of them. But if you're buying in a huge building, right, just know that by the time you go to sell, you're probably going to have lots of competition. So a lot of these ritzy, glitzy, you know, skyscrapers near Times Square that's going up, um, they have so many units in those buildings. And when it comes time to sell your unit, that's just something you need to keep in mind because chances are you're gonna have a lot of competition in that building because there's just so many units. Um, yeah, I've noticed this trend in the city now, just at least with some of the buyers that I'm working with right now. They're looking for more bespoke product in buildings with less than 50 units. They tell me they don't really wanna see their neighbors, they want low common charges, they don't really need all these amenities. So there's a really a market for everything, but it's just important to vet out all these things before you buy, I guess. All right, guys, here we are at Zuccotti Park. Now, this is where the Occupy Wall Street protests started, right here on the corner of Liberty and Trinity Place. I always talk about this interesting mini documentary series. It's called I Am The One Percent by Peter Schiff. And he filmed this with Reason TV. You got to check it out. I think you'd enjoy it. It's called I Am The One Percent. And it's filmed right here in Zuccotti Park. So when you watch that mini documentary series, you may think everything is familiar. You're like, oh, wow, this looks familiar. But in the background, none of these buildings are going to be here because this was all under construction. All this stuff is new. <laughs> the LT prod. Yeah, I mean, look, my take on politics is don't stress yourself out about it. You know, let people vote for who they want to vote for. I feel like nowadays people like have this raging thirst. They have like raging. It's like they're so pent up. Like I could feel their pent upness. If they say, oh my God, you vote, you're going to vote for Trump. Oh, and they just like freak out. It's like, dude, take a breath. Everything will be all right. Just let people do what they want to do and chill. Because if Biden gets elected, everything's going to work out to be all right. I can promise you that. If Trump gets reelected, everything's going to be fine. We're still going to make money. It's been like that forever in America, okay? You know, I remember when Trump first got elected. I was in college and, not lying, some of my professors were in tears. And I'm like, get the fuck, I'm like, guys, I'm like, put your big boy pants on and get to work. Like, seriously, are you that soft? And then on the flip side, I remember when President Biden won the election, everybody was like, that's the end of America. 
America is going to come to an end. No more opportunity, no more prosperity. And we've had one of the most ferocious bull markets ever. And I mean, we've come, doubled our accounts. It's been like insane. It's been b very, very blessed. So relax, okay? Put your head on straight and be an operator, right? Be a professional operator. Because when you're like frazzled and freaking out all over the place, Nobody ever makes a good decision when you're all bent out of shape and freaked out. So, take a breath and everything's going to be all right. I promise you that. All right, Trinity Church. Now here on Wall Street. Guys, this right here behind us is one Wall Street. This is the largest office to condo conversion in the city's history. Now, Harry Mackelow, Mackelow Properties, led the development, or I should really say led the you conversion. I've honestly given up and I'm, and I'm... And look, the building's nice. Don't get me wrong. I think they overdid it a little bit on the luxury aspect. It's about 20% sold. You have a Whole Foods in here. You have your own private club. You have your own private restaurant. It's a nice building. Now, Harry Mackelow is also, well, really the mastermind behind 432 Park, which is that gorgeous building right on the corner of 56th Street and Park Avenue. Hey, Bighorn MT, what's going on? Yeah, today was a good day. Rain finally stopped, thank God. And hopefully tomorrow is shaping up to be a really good day in New York City, my friends. All right, let's head down and check out the Mighty Bull, and then we'll look at the New York Stock Exchange. Let me make sure my phone's not gonna die. So right at the end of Broadway, you have the beautiful Mighty Bull. 
Now you also, well, I should say you used to have the fearless girl right at the end here. But they've now relocated her right in front of the New York Stock Exchange. Doesn't look like there's too many tourists out here too. Mr. King of Florida, Tom, do you know Okeechobee, Florida? I don't. Why, is there any good things going on there? There's a few people at the Mighty Bull. Ah, the mighty bull, the sign of opportunity, prosperity for all. Love it. Who knows, with the, the market in correction, maybe this will provide us a positive omen for a little bit of a bounce. Uh, MD says, I don't argue over politics anymore. I share my point of view uh, and try to engage in healthy convos. Yeah, I mean, I think the sooner people just realize just to not get bent out of shape over it, it's like, who cares? You know, I live in uh, New York City and everybody is a liberal and a Democrat that I associate with. I'm probably the only conservative and nobody cares because it doesn't matter. You vote for who you want to vote for, I vote for who I want to vote for, and whoever wins, wins. America goes on. Innovation and prosperity will continue here in perpetuity forever. It doesn't matter who's in office. That's it. Who cares? All right, let's go around the back side, and we'll take you guys right at the New York Stock Exchange. NBA Elias, Dow Futures now down 490. You know, puts a call is also going crazy too. If you look at the puts a call ratio, that's also going to Mars too. Deborah says, are you discussing politics with your coworkers and friends? Yeah, a lot of times, particularly if you're talking about deals, like structuring deals, or you're talking to investors. You know, I'm on a lot of these calls and a lot of these investors that were trying to pitch deals in Manhattan, they're like, nope, bring us any deal. We're not investing in New York. And I try to talk some sense into these guys. And these are some very big name investors, by the way, uh, in private equity, real estate private equity that you would know. I mean, these people are on like CNBC and it's like, dude, relax. New York City is not uninvestable. I'm like, you're going to be looking back on this moment in five years and you're going to say, wow, they were given some of these deals away and I didn't participate in them because I had a political bias. So yeah, it comes up all the time. There's a lot of investors that will not buy good deals in New York City right now because of politics and myself and my it's boss broadway. uh broadway, broadway yeah. oh yeah it's uh directly at the end you're gonna see the mighty bull like the wall Thanks, street man. bull Appreciate it. yeah have a good one uh yeah some people are like i don't i don't i won't look at deals in new york i'm like that's just irrational that's ridiculous i'm like stop it stop it and they're like nope we do not want to look at any deals in blue states I'm like, that's just ridiculous. You can make money anywhere. 
Uh, a good deal is a good deal. You know, don't let politics get in the way uh, of a good investment. Because just like throughout history, the city is very cyclical. It's always been like this in New York. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you know true New Yorkers uh, know this. The city goes through peaks, it goes through troughs. Uh, hold on, I gotta plug my phone in. Debra says, why do they think New York City is too liberal? Yeah, general, generally the answer is yes, people's money. You have, you have the fiduciary duty to allocate investors' capital in the safest possible way to generate an appropriate return. And again, a problem that's happening in New York City right now um, is all of these crazy, well, I should say just the big... How do I just be very frank about this? They don't favor the landlord. They favor the tenant. And you have a lot of squatter problems. Uh, property rights are being infringed. But our kind of pitch back to kind of try to reframe that conversation is, look, things are gonna change. Uh, city government and politicians have acknowledged that they've made an error, right? And the Adams administration is working diligently to try to correct a lot of the, uh, you know, the wrongdoings that have been going on in the city. And that's actually true, by the way. Um, it just takes time. There's a lot of bureaucracy, but over time that'll change. You're gonna see New York City, in order to stay competitive, which we will always be competitive, um, you won't see all these stories on the news of people just squatting and they can get away with it. There's gonna be legislation that's gonna change that. There's gonna be common sense laws to rectify that situation and level heads will prevail. That's gonna happen. Uh, and I think a lot of smart investors are seeing through that, right? We just announced and we just talked about this on last night's stream, uh, Citadel Securities uh, has approved plans to go forward with a new multi-billion dollar super tall skyscraper right on Park Avenue. You think that Ken Griffin would be allocating capital and doing that if he didn't think that there was a big future in New York City? Of course not. He's one of the wealthiest and most, you know, prolific hedge fund managers on the planet Earth, right? He's not just going to throw money after bad. So, but look, that's what makes a market at the end of the day, right? Opposing views, volatility, uncertainty creates mispricings and opportunity in the market. And our view is that all of the uncertainty right now in New York City is creating a fair share of mispricings, uh, which investors, and many are, will capitalize on it and do really, really well. So yeah, these are conversations we have every day. Wow, guys, look at this beautiful shot of the New York Stock Exchange. Gorgeous. Now, a lot of these buildings surrounding the New York Stock Exchange have been converted to condos. Looks like there's something going on over here. And here you have these beautiful Belgian block streets.
Now, here you have Federal Hall, and unfortunately, you're gonna have scaffolding for nine more years. We have one year down, nine more to go. Robert says, Tom, have you ever seen a ro rodent in my apartment? In my apartment right now? No. Uh, in previous apartments? Yeah, many, several, unfortunately. But yes, multiple, multiple rodents in previous apartments in New York. I'd say over five, under 10. <laughs> over, under, five, 10. Yeah, the LT prods, as many people don't mind paying higher taxes if they feel that they're getting their money's worth. I totally agree. I think that's also what's different about millennials and Gen Z. I really do. Because uh, previously before, people were like, oh, you know, we don't want to pay any taxes at all. I honestly don't mind paying the high taxes. I paid very high taxes my entire life living in New York City which is essentially half the money you make goes to the government. I don't have a problem with that, on, but if the services are pristine and fantastic, but when the subways are dirty and they don't run on time and things get a little bit too dangerous, well then you gotta start to push back on the government and say, hey man, you know, you're taking 50% of what I make, you know, just clean it up a little bit. That's all we're asking. You know, clean up the trains, clean up everything. But if the subways were spotless, they ran on time. Yeah, I don't see why paying 50% in taxes is a bad thing. If you have services that are out of this world, I mean, that's kind of what you want. At least that's what I want. I won't speak for anybody else. Um, that's why it's kind of like such a contrast when I'm down in Florida, particularly like Sunny Isles Beach, North Miami Beach, Brickell, you know, Miami in general, like the infrastructure is so solid. Now, granted, there's a lack of public transportation, but the public transportation that's there is pretty good uh, and it's clean and things are good. So I, would, I wouldn't mind paying, you know, higher taxes. It's funny because there's no state income tax there. I think the problem is it's when you don't have good stewardship of the money. That's why when people say, you know, you know, $5 billion could solve world hunger. There's no amount of money that could solve world hunger actually, because money is illusionary. If you think about it, money doesn't exist. It's the person or the collective of people who are in charge of the money is what matters. And when you have people that are derelict in their duties to allocate capital, then you, you could give them a trillion dollars and it wouldn't matter, <laughs> right? They would still turn it to zero. So what matters is not the money. What matters is the efficiency and the stewardship of that money. That's why it's so important, you know, if you are investing in a company, you know, you don't necessarily care, right? How much revenue they're doing and growing the revenue or how much they're bringing in. It's the return on your equity, right? What, how, how efficient are you at running and sustaining that business? And I think right now, New York City isn't the best at allocating capital. Uh, and I think that's pretty proven. If anything, some of these, you know, social programs are just pretty much slush funds to keep people employed to actually make the problem not go away. Uh, that's actually happened quite often than not. All right, guys, this is 95 Wall Street. This used to be an office building, but now it is luxury condos. You see a lot of these uh, older office buildings now being converted into apartments. I think the founding fathers had it right. 
to Peter's point, you know, no taxation without representation. If you're represented well and things are good, you know, it's justified. The money's justified. Roberts is what year was that building built? I'm not too sure. 95 wall? I don't know. Maybe the 70s? Something like that? Maybe 1970 something? It's not like super old, but I don't know. It still gives off the impression you're living inside kind of an apartment building now. That's just my personal take. Like the it's good that people are converting these offices into condos. That's very good. We need more supply on the market so we can get prices down so people could afford to live. That's good. But, you know, a lot of the office to condo conversion projects, you can kind of like feel like it's an it was an office, if, that, if I'm making sense. Um, which, you know, not the worst thing in the world. Maybe they'd be better as rentals. So I think it'd be good rental business, but I don't know if anybody would want to purchase that as like their primary. Ah, Roberts is 1977. Good stuff. This is the old AIG building. Right off of Maiden Lane. Rockstar says 50% tax is brutal. Well, it's brutal and it's not because there's give and take. Here's kind of how I think about it. Um, in New York City, this, in my opinion, is the best place to start a career, in my view. Uh, you have such a high concentration of talent in a very, very small proximity of a location. So it's kind of like a pay to play, right? So yeah, you have the high taxes, but you arguably have the best place on earth to nurture a career in finance, in big law, in tech, really in anything you want to do, the best of the best is in New York City. So in that aspect, it's like, you know, if you're calculating a risk reward ratio, I would say, yes, it's important to factor in reducing your tax burden as much as possible, but not when you're young. I think when you're young, don't worry about, you know, trying to save 20 grand a year, okay? Or don't worry about trying to save 10 grand a year in your tax bill. Uh, I like to say, don't pick up a penny to miss the huge pile of cash down the road, right? Pay the high tax, get involved in New York, build out your network, get to know people, you know, progress in your career. And then once you're really, really established, in your career you know and you have some assets under your belt that's when you can kind of think about the tax planning the estate planning but when you're young like in your 20s and even in your 30s it's all right you know don't freak out that you're paying ridiculous taxes in new york because the city's providing you with unbelievable opportunities like amazing amazing opportunities at least that's what happened for me the new york city provided me with everything I have, literally, in life. Um, so I, I don't have any complaints. Wow, the South Street Seaport's empty. It almost looks a little eerie, doesn't it? Looks nice though. If you go further down here, you'll run into that new tin building, which is awesome. Maybe we'll have to do some live streams all the way down there during the summer. You have amazing views of the Brooklyn Bridge, the Manhattan Bridge, and all of Dumbo. MD says, yeah, that's what I was thinking earlier. Seems very quiet. 
but then again, I don't know the areas. Well, in general, I would say Tribeca down tends to be very, very quiet after 7 p.m. Very quiet. But if we were doing the live stream in Midtown Manhattan, like 34th Street all the way up to about maybe 57th Street, that is a very, very heavy foot trafficked place pretty much 24 seven, honestly, even at, you know, one, 2 AM. So that's why, you know, places like Tribeca, Upper East Side, Upper West Side are a little bit better for living. You know, like we talked about before, especially if you have kids. Because it's quiet. You know, not a lot of people want to be in the hustle and bustle all the time. Now, one of my favorite buildings is right here, 130 William. This is one of the best buildings in all of New York City, really. Such cool architecture, has a great amenity package. And it was one of the best selling condos of 2022. Peter says, how about the Upper East Side for raising a family? I think it's very good Upper East Side. The only thing it's a little pricey, well, not a little pricey. It's a lot pricey and not really my style. I would much rather raise kids on the Upper West Side. That's just me personally. I feel as if the Upper West Side's more relaxed. And when I mean more relaxed, it's like not so pretentious in a way. Upper East Side is very private schools. I don't know, it's just a little bit too stiff for me. Now it's beautiful, it's gorgeous. But just for me, I don't know. It, I, I think if I had kids, I'd just send them to the public school. I went to public school, I turned out all right. I mean, I don't know. I, I get it, it's good for networking and it's kind of like a club, but also I think kids need to be well-rounded. I think it's important for kids to be around everybody of all different like socioeconomic backgrounds. It makes them a little bit more well-rounded, I guess. Well, here we are, this is 130 William. Beautiful building. Josie says, Tom, can I ask a question? How will the congestion pricing affect businesses below 60th Street? Well, Essentially, if you drive a car south of 60th, you're gonna have to pay a toll. And I think that toll is like 12 bucks. Now for businesses, like how is it going to affect businesses specifically? I think they'll just pass that cost on to the consumer. That's what I think is gonna happen. Is that me? So if you are like an electrician or you're an HVAC mechanic and you're driving into the city from Long Island City or something like that, They'll probably just pass that toll on and add it as a service charge, possibly. So a lot of people are like, you know what? I don't drive. I'm not gonna have to worry about the congestion pricing. Eh, I think everybody will pay it inadvertently. You know, if I was like an HVAC person or electrician or a truck driver, and I have to pay a $12 toll every time I drive into Manhattan, well, I'm probably just gonna maybe raise prices on my customers or add on like a service charge to kind of offset that cost. I don't know, that's what I think. Maybe I'll be wrong. I just find it very hard to believe that businesses will just eat that price, right? 
And if you remember two years ago, a lot of the conversation around inflation uh, we were talking about is, and we've successfully predicted this too, is that the government is going to blame inflation on corporate greed, which is ridiculous because corporations have to maintain their gross margin. And when raw materials go up, they're not just gonna happily pay the higher price, they offload that cost to the consumer. And that's kind of when you have that death spiral. It's because when raw materials go up or when wholesale prices go up, corporations just don't happily pay that, right? This isn't the charity tank. They pass those costs on to consumers, to me and you, and then we pay more. All right, this is 130 William. There's gonna be a coffee shop that comes in here, Flower Coffee. This is gonna be a cool little spot for the tenants and the residences here. Beautiful architecture. The architect here is Sir David Ajade. Really, really stunning work. I love it here. I know Hawaii says this is her favorite building. This is one of my favorite buildings too. It's awesome here. And for whatever reason, it smells amazing in there. Like really, really, really good. Let me sit down. All right, everybody. Well, I think we'll call it a night there. This was kind of cool to explore lower Manhattan, walk around a different neighborhood than what we usually do. So if you enjoyed the stream, feel free to leave a like on the video. Click the subscribe button if you're new and we will see you all right back here tomorrow on Walks in Wall Street. If you'd like to subscribe to our free investing newsletter, you can do so by scanning the QR code on your screen and punching in your email and that will take you to our Substack. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. God bless and be safe. D, Juan Carlos, MD, Hawaii, Joe Driver, Western Mass, Dave, the LT Prod, Sharon, AUS Fly Girl, all of our moderators, Mike D, thank you so much for joining. Uh, Gary Carpenter, Jim, N NFL7, uh, who else we got here? Muhammad, Joe Driver, Patrick, New York, AUS Fly Girl, and Tatted T. See you guys tomorrow. Take care. Look at this dog here. <laughs>